mindset is everything. And if you, let me put it this way. If you have the mindset, then even if you don't have the skill set, you can either do, you know, learn it or find it, mm. find the who, right? And if you have that mindset, then even if you don't have the resources and the tools, you can always either build them, find them, create them, leverage them. The Move Entrepreneur Evolved Podcast. Get on it. All right. So we made it in. Edward Beltron. How are you, man? How are you, man? Thank you so much for having me here. I'm pretty excited to, to dive in and, and, you know, talk about what, what entrepreneurs do, how we evolve, and all the things that we don't normally see behind the scenes, right? This is, this is I believe, what is important and must be heard. So I appreciate you having me on the show. Well, very exciting here as well. I think that um, we have a lot of things that are in common, but we'll, let's get into those. But first off, um, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, what you do. You help uh, travelers build a global business and lifestyle off and online, and you help them create momentum and learn to live a global lifestyle without having to choose between money or freedom. I'm going to tell you right now, my friend, um, I, I went through your stuff. Uh, I read through um, your, uh, your small ebook that you created, uh, though I think that takes a lot of creativity to write. Um, and I went through some of your stuff and I, I wanted to share with you that there was something that I was going to dive right into uh, right away. And that is, what is, a, um, what is a nomad to you? Because yeah, that's a, I think it's a quite, mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. a good question because I think in the, in the sense of what we talk about nomads today can be a bit conflicting, you know, the, the term can turn off to a, lot, a lot of people, but um, I think when it comes to the nomad or nomadism, a lot of people talk about having that mobility to move around any country, right? And I see, I see one issue here though, and that's because a lot of the people tend to, you know, we, we are as humans, we tend to stay on extremes. And one of the things is as we stay in one place alone, and then, you know, we try to do everything in one place, we stick to that one place for, for everything, all our, our areas in our life. And when it comes to the mobility or, or the moment that people actually have that freedom to travel, then they'll just jump right into being in a country for three days and then next country, three days and the next country, three days. Right. So I think, um, to answer that question, you know, the nomad for me is something that represents being able to move and being able to adapt to that country and live and thrive in that country, regardless of the time that, you know, that we're talking about. And yeah, as, as I say, because of what's happening right now or, or how things have moved into our future, I think it's a lot about moving constantly or moving fast. And it's not always like this. So I, I personally really appreciate, especially now that I've been through that stage, I think I appreciate more the side of slow travel or when it comes to actually living in the country, not traveling to the country. Of course, you, you, you know, you're always gonna visit a place, but staying in one place and really being able to adapt, to integrate, to localize yourself, as I call it, and you know, to be able to use and leverage those opportunities that you have in that country to, of course, make your life better, to complement things with your life and also the other way around so that you can help people wherever that you are. So I think that that term of nomad will, will go a lot of ways for a lot of people, right? But uh, I believe it's, it's forgotten in, in a way that the real essence of the nomad. So I don't know what you think. <laughs> Maybe, um, you know, it, it, so I did a lot of traveling uh, like, like yourself and meant, spent a lot of time in different countries and different cultures. And one of the things about kind of, it, it's almost like a modern day gypsy. <laughs> yeah. Right. In a way. And one of the questions that I thought, you know, I'd like to talk about is how do you set yourself up? Um, because when traveling a lot, many people for many years on corporate positions, uh, you do travel, but you always have like a home base, right? So when you consider yourself a nomad business uh, traveler and doing business, how has it affected you not having a core home? And, and I, I, this kind of, we can dive in a little bit further because I think it was very difficult for me because the anchor, like our lives, we need anchors. So in your uh, experience, what has been like an anchor so that you can go different places, but you don't just lose your mind because changing cultures quickly is very difficult. 
It's very difficult on yeah. your own, especially if you're alone. <laughs> exactly. And it's always a new reality, a new, right, new bubble, let's call it, new social bubble, new everything. And I, I, I believe it's, I call it like being like a baby again, but better. Because it's pretty cool. I mean, when you go to a new country, of course, you get the chance to readapt and to find new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things. But I, I love this this question particularly because it's it's exactly one of the things that I, I you know I dive in, into my core message or the core message that I want to transmit to people. And the issue here is I always thought that I had to choose between these two ends, right? I was either having money and having stability and a lifestyle in one place, or having no money, right? Having no home, no stability, nowhere, right? So it, it was like, oh, yeah, I am a nomad and like I belong everywhere and like I have no home, but everywhere is my home. And while that worked for me for a while, it also, I also got to a point where I was thinking like, why, why on earth do I have to starve while I feel so alive? You know, because you're going under your, it's like you're, you're budgeting. It's always on a budget. And I got to the point that I was so sick of it. And I was like, I, I don't want to have to do this anymore. I don't want to have to budget travel. And we can, we can talk about that, of course. But I think part of the mindset that the travelers develop most of the time is like, oh, yeah, like hell to nine to five, you know, hell with with like all the capitalism and blah, 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 blah. And then you jump to that extreme thinking like, oh, I'm so spiritual or, you know, I'm, I'm humble. I am connected with nature or things like that that can also be extreme in, in I don't know. It's just, there's two, two ends, right? But there's also a middle point. And when it comes to that, I, you know, there's, there's a part of having an anchor and having something that you can hold on to and parting both ways so that, so that if they say tomorrow, cause you know, maybe in the next four, four years, you're like, oh, it's amazing. And then tomorrow you're thinking, well, I think it's time for me to stop traveling and then go back home. And then the other way around and say, no, no, like I'll travel forever. Maybe there's both ways. And no one knows because you might feel different tomorrow. But I think the whole point with having an anchor and actually having that home is not about having one home or having no home, but maybe, you know, meeting these two worlds and these ends and saying, well, what if I have a couple of bases around the world or a couple of, right? Like home bases or, so or pillars. You yourself that, I like that. <laughs> but do you anchor those as like those so that when you're there, do you have things that you're familiar with? Do you have things that are, because one thing that, and, and this is exciting to talk with you because I think that um, I went through this. You, you um, I guess I'll share it like this right away. I, I understood <laughs> homelessness. Like I, I, yeah, I okay. understood, um, unfortunately, to understand when you would go homeless, you are lost to, it's like wherever you go, kind of you consider home, but you're lost. You're, you're yeah. lost and not so much like wandering, you're right? That, you're lost. And so yeah. um, when you would travel and you do business, the business takes, it, there's a, there's an intellect that has to trigger. And how are you finding yourself? If a better word would be frame, like reframe yourself so that you can go into that world. Because when you travel, you really do. It's like, Oh, that's a new fruit. And you're like, oh, and then you taste it. And then you're in a whole nother world. And, 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 and then you got to go back to the structure. How have you found yourself the ability to pr be productive and uh, for lack of better words, in the clouds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, what we're talking about in terms of the speed and the distance as well, when it comes to the traveling or mobility, right? Is how fast you travel and how fast you're moving around. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you go to a new country often, then you'll get, and I had it too, uh, you know, getting easily distracted by all these things around us. I just want to go to that new place or I just want to visit that mountain or whatever it is that, you know, you always have this like shiny thing in front of you and it becomes hard for you to focus and have, you, you must have a lot of discipline when it comes to like, yeah, you know, right, right now is not the moment, but the, the best way for me to, you know, to, to kind of, um, for me to tackle that, let's say, if that, you know, for the lack of a better word, but for me to tackle that part is actually localizing yourself and slowing down in terms of traveling and being able to connect yourself so that you turn that that perspective of being a tourist 
that page, you turn it as fast as possible. So you're actually a local. Now, a local behaves very different than a tourist in a country. Of course, when you're new to the things, you just want to be everywhere. You want to take pictures. You want to meet. You want to try food. You want to you do everything that comes with, with that spectrum, right? With the with tourist spectrum. So it's like a, an, an external kind of sphere or some, some way that you see it. And so the intention is whenever I go to that new place, I personally try to stay minimum six months or a year or even more. Mm-hmm. But I have certain places that adapt for me, right? So what, what you would say, oh, it goes to me. Yeah, Jason, I, I, maybe I would like a place like this. And then so you choose or you pick according to what you want, right? But that differs in priorities. In, in my sense, it's like I thought, okay, so this country has certain things that are good for what I want to do in my lifestyle. And so I want to go there and I want to learn the, the language. I want to learn how to integrate into the culture. I want to connect with people, develop network. So I actually create that actual, you know, like home, so to say, to become a local, even though you have that global thinking. But everywhere that you go, you act so local that you can camouflage or you can become one of them, understand their system to the core. Right. So it's, it's all about, and I think when it comes to this balance of not getting distracted, it's always about spending maybe a couple of first weeks or so in that mode and then eventually saying, okay, cool. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of done with the tourist side of it. And I've spent a lot of time in maybe in the new bars or the restaurants, I've tried the food. And now I think it's time for me to get to the next level of this phase in the same country. So it's, it's like different levels, right? It's the touristic aspect, then the transitioning part. And then I call it like, um, it's like deep level scouting or like global, like imagine you're like a, a Boy Scout or something and you go there to that country and try to really explore and find all those gems and opportunities that will complement with your lifestyle and your vision. So I, I think that's a kind of, answer. Oh. I, no, I think that's <laughs> a great answer. And I think that, um, you know, I, I, I share this a lot. And I think that um, a lot of, even in our world, as you, as you travel and you see that we have struggles with, um, you know, we have struggles with race, we have struggles with, um, you know, people not in, 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 you know, understanding each other. There's these divides we have. And I think that what I've learned, and I'm going to go into one of your statements, because I think it was fantastic, was that really we're culturalists. And we don't have the ability to understand each other's culture. And so when we can't understand each other's culture, we tend to label certain things quickly. And I think that um, your story of what you just told of how you adapt is, is, it's really cool to speak with you because um, not many people have I sat down that did business and there's a lot that we do talk to, but I think your story lays out a lot of honesty. And I think that, um, you know, when you get to that country, I found find three things that I know the price of everywhere. Like I would always find a Red Bull, but every single can was different, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I would go find a Starbucks coffee because ironically enough, I don't care what country I was in, there was a Starbucks coffee. (laughs) And I would try to find what that value of that piece was. And that kind of gave me some peace. And I think what you're sharing here is when when you do travel um to engage in what's actually going in that little bubble and if you would i I think you would agree in the way you're saying this is that you actually leave with a stamp on you not just a flash from a camera yeah and that depthness it, it 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 goes with you you know and so when, when you go and meet other people and you do travel, and I'm going to go into a statement that you said, but I believe that when you come back to your home or so, your ability to communicate with people that are of different cultures literally goes through the roof because they have a moment to say, you actually cared enough to even learn about that specific temple you learned three words and they sound like shit, but you know what <laughs> you, you try, you know, I, I, I tried to learn, I was fighting in Thailand. So I learned, I call fighting Muay Thai, <laughs> which is basically <laughs> like, you know, get up yeah. and can I get some food to go to the bathroom? But I learned enough. And what I found was that the love that I got from the community from doing that. So I had a, a comment that you made here and I, I thought that I would 
kind of bring it up because it was so, it was just really good. And it said, I believe traveling itself is a, is just about the beginning of your fulfilling life to be able to fuel a greater version of you. Because if you have one country's idea and one country's resources and one country's whatever, it might be a bit limited compared to having just two options. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? You see, when we're talking about creating a lifestyle, right, we, we tend to have, we, we are born in one country, right? We, we, we speak that language and then we use those, re, let's say we go to school to that place and we learn the way that things are done in that way and socially and culturally speaking and even financially, right? You have your bank account or you have your business or you have whatever it is in that country. And so when it comes to creating a global lifestyle, I think a lot of it also complements when you think about what you can take from other countries. Cause, and I loved the way that you said that you live with a stamp, right? Not with the flash. And that's, that's a lot about what I, I used to do. So I, I used to partly do one of, one of those things, which was, I've always tried to, you know, integrate as much as possible. And here's the signal, Jason, when people tell me like, oh, you are a Turkish by heart, or when people say like, ah, oh, I thought you were Japanese on the phone, or, you know, when they, whenever they say that one type of like comment, whenever they say that one thing, I know I've kind of, you know, made it successfully into integrating and really understanding the core and the deeper aspect of that culture, because this is very different, you know, taking pictures and understanding the, the, basis of, of the, the popular restaurants in Paris or wherever that you are but it's a different challenge and it's a different level to really be able to extract and connect with that culture in the sense that you say huh well I thought you know and that's what what happened to me let's say in just in, in even in simple aspects like like being on time right I, I, I like being on time and in Japan, it was like, you say 11.00, and it was like exactly at that minute. And if something else happened, they, they were like, <laughs> right? It was too much. And when I was there, I, I liked that fact so much because I was valuing my time and thinking I can get so much done because everything is, 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 you know, at the right time and the right everything. And in, in Mexico, you say, let's have a party at eight. People will start showing up by 9.30. And so adapting that idea and saying you know what like i will i like this aspect of the culture i want to integrate it into my life in the way that i, I do things and as much as there are people in mexico that do it in then 8 to 9 30 they show up there's also people that will appreciate that right and you cannot always push your ideas or your ideologies into people especially when you're trying to push other countries normal like normalities or normal things into your country or other countries right but the whole thing is when you when you stay above and to say in the cloud when you have the power to be in the cloud as a global citizen or as someone who can see and adapt easily between these countries then that's a superpower and i and, and i say it a lot it's 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 like being like water because I, i've got you here my friend because you've <laughs> looked back over here i i you you jumped on it because you did such a good job so i'm gonna i'm gonna do it all right so i'm gonna go at it <laughs> Go for it. So I, <laughs> and I saw it behind and I was like, wow. <laughs> you said uh, nomadism allows you to be like water or like a chameleon. It's what gives you the superpower to be yourself and unleash the superpower of superpowers. I think that you are absolutely right. And I think that um, one thing, I, I guess I'll, let me transition into this. Um, You speak a little bit about in your book about uh, how do I get his? Like, I don't even know how to say it properly. People are gonna probably say, "Adi Zayla," like, but it was almost like you had to vomit out all this stuff. And it, like, you, brain dump. You, you, Ebo, you basically say like, "I was, I had so much in, I can't get it out." And I'm, and and I, yeah. I felt as someone that has traveled a lot as well. I felt you, and 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 the irony of all of that, if that makes sense, I truly felt because I've, I've been there. And mm. what you're, what you're doing is you're almost purging out all of this stuff, but how did you find a way to create outlets for that? You see, it was, it was pretty one, interesting. One more, and I don't mean to cut you off, but this might actually add more to mm -hmm. it, which would be what would hold you back 
from not sharing that as well. Yeah, you nailed it with that question. And let, let me tell you that story because it all really goes back to the, to the beginning of me when I st first started traveling. And uh, as, as you say, it was, it was like constipation. You know, I, I called 2010 to 2020 around that, you know, stage that decade, I call it the, the, my decade of growth in, in a way, but it was not complete because I didn't have that perspective of contribution. And that's something I want to start focusing. a little bit more about that. You're, you I, I want to start focusing on that aspect when it comes to, let's say this new decade, 2020 to 2030, I want to be able to focus on growth, but also in contribution. So I call it the decade of contribution when it comes to, you see, I, I came to a point and I, and I will tell you a little bit about the story, but I came to a point where I was in a full on, you know, like full-time depression <laughs> and I really got to the point where I, I had these existential questions in my mind and I thought, well, yes, like traveling is very cool. And I've been traveling for eight years and I can speak these languages and I've seen all these places and I've seen all these things. And I've always, because I didn't want to come off as cocky, let's say like, that's one, that was one of my main things. You know, I was, I was trying not to seem like, oh yeah, like I'm cool because, you know, I travel or I'm cool because blah, blah, especially when I went back home. Because every time, that I went back home and I had been in a new country, I felt even more distanced or misunderstood of the way that, you know, see different things out there. And then the people in, at home, they, they keep that same mindset or they just didn't evolve in the same or as fast, right, in the same way. And so every time I came back, I, I felt that restriction of speaking out because I didn't want to seem like, oh, well, in Japan, we do things like this, right? Or, oh, well, like if you were in China, like in China, da, 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 or whatever country, and it's funny because I, well, my intention was good, let's say. I was trying to avoid something negative that for me was negative. It ended up being me actually, you know, holding that back when I, I could have helped or I, I could have shared that to enlighten, inspire, motivate, guide other people. And it really, it was all about, there's, there's a particular part of this with my dad's relationship. And I'm very transparent about it. You know, I'm honest and I'm authentic. And that's part of what I need to do as well, to speak out, right, find my voice and be able to share that message because that's part of it. And um, I remember he, he always used to tell me like, oh, you're so cocky, right? He, he, he said, you're so cocky. Whenever people don't speak about what you think it's cool, then you just don't say anything. And then you just look at everyone like they're losers. Like I was, you know, maybe, maybe I was, my facial expression was like, ah, oh, fuck, like, I was sorry for the word, but I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, ah, oh, like, <laughs> there's speaking about like going out this weekend again, oh, you know, maybe that was my face. I don't know. But part of it was like, ah, oh, like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just not worth sharing. And like, what am I going to share? And I don't want to seem cocky. I don't want to seem cockier than my, like my father is telling me that I already, you know, so the whole thing here was I, I got used to, I it became a habit. We're creatures of habit. I, I got so used to not speaking out and always having this constant thought in my head, like, yeah, if, even if I say it, people won't understand. And so it just, you know how it began to, it became like a, a little world inside of my head that I couldn't really connect with in the outside. And I was so conflicted and like, ah, this is who I am. This is what I think. This is what I believe. But if I, if I play like a song in my phone on speakers, let's say, my dad would be like, ah, like now you're listening to that like Indian crap. It feels like they're vomiting. And I felt so judged. And then next thing, you know, I, maybe I would be learning Chinese and then be like, oh, you're already trying to learn Chinese. You don't even speak Russian properly. And so every single little detail became part of that, you know, those beliefs that you start creating in your mind and thinking yeah maybe this is not a value yeah maybe this is not worth it yeah you know what like yeah maybe i'll just i'll keep quiet uh, like there's no point of me sharing that and and why would i share that if that's for me it's not it's not to show off it's for me so i'll keep it for myself and that's what happened literally since day one i'm telling you i went to japan as my first experience abroad well i, I traveled to a, a few other countries but japan was my first ever one like a year exchange it's amazing isn't it and i am biased of course because it was you know it was my exchange year like of course i am biased as well 
you always have that one that thing like your first love right and it was part of it and so being there and ex experiencing all these different things really changed that switch that Japan mindset was like it was almost like a cleansing for me like it was almost really? like it was almost like it was so done well like even if you missed that meeting you're only three minutes out the train <laughs> like it's like right coming at you and yeah. i think that um Japan was definitely one of those places where I felt I, I want to go back there to just to, to just get a like a, I don't know to, it's like take a Red Bull you know it's like let me go get their coffee real quick and come back because <laughs> when I came back I was like we do everything crazy like it makes sense there so diving uh, diving into that um, I think uh, kind of a uh, something I think maybe you've experienced as well and I think that what I've done, and I'm still trying to also express more of what my travels were. And I think that even talking with you brings more out for me. Um, as I listen to other people that traveled, so I've been to, I don't know, nine, 10 countries, I don't know more than that, and stayed long enough. What I found was the people that left those countries, and I probably just didn't accept it as my own, but the people that left those your country, and then you come back, the community tends to kind of out you're different now and that it, it's very interesting because the people that will say things to you they don't mean it it's just the words that they don't know how to now they don't know how to relate to that and i think that people want to and so i've always had an attitude and my friends and i've had family and i say look i'm over here and they're like oh, i'm gonna get on a plane like it was almost <laughs> like i was the guy that would go and like Unfortunately, maybe I'd be the guy in the front cutting the bamboo and then they can <laughs> kind of come with me, you know, but mm -hmm. my question in, in that whole scenario was what did you put in your mind to be able to block that? Because I can feel it from you that you didn't just get it from that scenario. It was probably from multiple scenarios, but that's a pretty powerful person in your life, right? And his intentions, the love of a father, I'm sure his intentions were a hundred percent they were just whatever but also we reflect things that we don't ever do sounds yeah. like you have a good dad you just was trying to figure it out <laughs> yeah, we all have issues right in, in that way yeah it's, it's normal. normal so yeah. as far as when you did that what were the benefits though those were painful things what was the benefits of business what was the benefits that when you started to do business what was that difference when you would meet different cultures how did how did you feel they looked at you because maybe this one person was just like, hey, you left the nest and you didn't take me. But really the people that you met that are the new people or whatever, you have, they're, they don't know you. So they only know the new you. So how did you put that armor on to then go out and express that without having to have that feeling anymore? I think it was, it was always uh, just psychologically hard to, to, cut off with that barrier when especially i don't know it's just physiological stuff sometimes right but it, it was just like oh, getting on a plane back to mexico and then like whoop, my mind was automatically in a different completely different mindset and so that didn't normally allow me to right to kind of break with that aspect or those beliefs earlier especially because i was always in that little bubble it's called a familiar bubble right and so whatever that your parents really tell you whatever that bubble okay i think maybe yeah was we all have that. Okay. And, and it's always comfortable, right? It's, it's like being in your comfort zone and then what, what people say or what people do. And then even if they don't say it directly, sometimes you start reading those messages. And as a traveler, that was one of the things, for example, like seeing, seeing my dad and, and, you know, having him like always in a bad mood and saying, ah, like, you know, business is like, ah, it's, it's, everything is effed up. And, you know, you, you kind of get these experiences and say, well, well like, I don't want to experience that. I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to be in that mood. I don't want to be like that with my kids. Or you always get the positive and the, and the negative in going to that point that you're, that you're staying, right? One of the aspects was for me, every time I got into that plane and go to a new country or went to a new country, it was just so liberating. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about like long-term, you know, stays as well. Cause I've, I've lived in seven countries, counting Mexico is seven countries and visited a lot of, of them, right? Like a couple of weeks or, or days or months, whatever, but it's like long, really long term. And every time I, I just got on that plane, it was like I could be myself again. 
and I wasn't afraid of being judged. But particularly this thing about sharing that, you know, it's like when you try to share and where you try to show that amazing thing that you've experienced, you say, wow, like, ah, oh, check this out. Like Thailand is so cool. You know, maybe they have Red Bull. And then you want to share that with, with other people. And because you don't have the same vision, the same perspective and all these things, it's just so hard to go back to that, like, let's call it that bubble and trying to put it into those words and say like, well, this is why it's amazing. And this is why I'm right surprised that this is why I believe it's so cool. And I believe that it could be cool for you as well. But always putting it like, let's say translating it. And it's just that, you know, one of those ironies to say like, oh, I can speak several languages, but I can't even communicate what I want to say sometimes. Mm, that was really interesting what like, you said. I can speak <laughs> multiple languages, but I can't communicate what I'm saying. I, that, it goes to show yeah. you that it's not language, right? It, it's exactly. more expression. I, I think that was true honesty. And I think that's really cool. I mean, I um, going into that, I, I, I had left Bali. I'd stayed in Bali for a little while and, um, I remember I'd came back to the U S um, and, um, I had some scenarios that I saw extreme poverty while I was there. And when you travel alone and you see that extreme poverty, it's very hard to take in because you don't have anybody to kind of go, that's, that's odd, right? Like, you, you, Hey, that's, that's a little different. Right. And you, mm. you don't have anybody to kind of go, yeah, it is. So you kind of go, is it? I think it, you, you only can handle with that. And I'll, and I'll share with you, I guess, on this here, you said it exactly when I would get on the plane and then I would land in another country. And if we, if I look back on my entire timeline, I would express and write and be very vocal about what's going on. When I got back to the U S I felt like I had to also be someone in the U S. And so I couldn't, I can't tell that story because now you're here. It was, you were absolutely right. There's a sense of freedom that comes along with that. So you have, um, three, um, these were your superpowers, but you go into these three um, and maybe we can dive in a little bit uh, on these. And you talk about a global citizenship. Now you're not talking about something that's actually signed off. You're using it as, mm. as, a, as a term. Am I correct? Yeah, because the citizenship is always understood as, as a political relationship with the government, right? Or it could be in terms of like legal aspects. A citizen is like very political word. It is more about being someone who can live and adapt and thrive anywhere, right? So it doesn't matter where you go. Yeah. And, don't, and don't even have to travel. That's, that's also a point. It's to be a global citizen, you don't even have to move because you can live a global lifestyle and have that mindset and all, 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 you know, that sense of your like, areas of life being diverse with colors, foods. Like I had uh, like biryani yesterday, like uh, Indian rice in mexico like it's part of you know what yeah so it's part of how you integrate these things into my life I, i'm not gonna eat tacos every day anymore <laughs> right i'm gonna compliment it. i'm gonna shift maybe every second day and the same thing like I, i've you know i was listening to some chinese songs like last week so it, it's always it always comes down to to it doesn't have to be about moving it has to be about opening into those uh, it sounds so cheesy, man, but when I ended my program in Japan, there was just this word, they always said it, and I, it was like, like an exchange program, and it was like a, it was like a multilingual like, club, and they had a couple of programs where you could go to different places, and they always had this one thing. Every, every week I used to meet with these people, it was like kids from maybe like newly born, literally, to like old men. And they were all participating in these activities, like dancing and singing and sharing experiences. So for me, that was one of the relieving parts of Japan where I was practicing my Japanese. But this one phrase and this one word, it was always kokoro hiraite. And it was like, open your heart. What is it? Kokoro. Kokoro. O. O. Like, kokoro hiraite. Kokoro hiraite. 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 Kokoro, koko. I, I just send it. Yeah. And the, the W O is just like an O. It's like there's no sound with the W in the W. But it's, they, they, they used to say, Kokoro hiraite, Kokoro hiraite. And it just got so freaking, you know, grand in my, in, in my, in everything that I was doing and thinking. And it means open your heart. Mm. And for me, when I look back in that point in time where, 
it was the end of my exchange and I was getting on the Shinkansen and the fast train going back, heading to the airport. And I was just like having the, all these flashbacks, like, like going back for, for a whole year, like 12 months of like all these experiences. You know, I was just going like super fast. Like, oh, getting here, da, 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 crying, amazing, laughing, da, 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 seeing all these faces, new faces. And I was like, what, why and how did it work? Like what happened that this thing became a successful experience for me? How was I able to have that answering the phone and saying, what's much it? And then thinking like, oh, is it? Oh, oh, I thought it was your brother, right? Like being able to integrate, being able to connect. I had a host family and being able to have friends. And I was the only guy in the public school, in Japanese school. So I was the only foreigner. Mm -hmm. So for me, it played out well that I could integrate and I could like transform into one of them, so to say, right? And thinking, what, what, what is it that I did right? And what happened that I was able to really connect and really thrive in this time? And I, I say it sounds so cheesy, but it was like, Kokoro I was thinking, yeah, it, it is all about opening your heart. It's the ability. Um, there is street smarts that comes with what you're doing. <laughs> right? There is. And so um, you, you find yourself in street smarts is, you know, number one, does my instincts tell me that I'm in a good place? And that, that's something that I learned is my instincts telling me, it'll, your body tells you, you it'll tell you. And then um, those instincts are obviously awareness. But I found with what you just said, by using that type of attitude, I was able to get into people's homes. Well, I didn't get into their homes. Let's clear that up. They invited me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very different. And we would eat food on the floor and we would experience those things. So in your, um, in your travels, you created uh, three different, now I don't know if these were the pillars, but I know that these were actions and, and pieces that are there. So um, one of them is the mindset, the skill set, and the tool set. And you wrap that around the mentality of a global citizen. Why don't you maybe share with me a little bit of each one? So maybe mindset of a global citizen Maybe you can go into a little bit of that. If someone said, look, I can run my business. I run a business, I, whatever that is. They just need to see me and I need to have a face. I could be wherever I want. What is the mindset that you go into that has to prepare them for that? Yeah. So one of the things is it like, of course, having a business does not mean, and again, right, moving also does not mean being a global citizen. But when it comes to that aspect, I call it the thrive, like evolution thrive or nomad, right? Which is like knowledge nomad. So being able to, learn and unlearn and be able to adapt that that would be the core that you apply to everything so it's the same thing that i apply for languages it's the same thing that i apply for adapting into a place for integrating for learning business for for doing everything because if you have the capacity to learn see how things are working and let's say hack that knowledge then you can learn very fast and you can unlearn these new things when you have to you know as we have this evolution right now <laughs> in time and whatever is, oh, it's time to shift to this direction or this focus. Then you have to let go of some things, some beliefs, some certain things or habits and rebuild new stuff, right? So talking about the mindset, I think is, and there's a reason why I put it as the first step, right? Because it's like, the, it's the bottom part of the, of the triangle or the pillar. Mindset is everything. And if you, let, let me put it this way. If you have the mindset, then even if you don't have the skill set, you can either do, you know, learn it or find it, mm. find the who, right? And if you have that mindset, then even if you don't have the resources and the tools, you can always either build them, find them, create them, leverage them, right? So it, it is all about that core of how you think and what are the beliefs that are holding you back. Now, when we're talking about global citizen, it's very important to, to, to have that one thing that is the belief of belonging everywhere, but not, not really in the, in the homeless term, right? Because that's probably something that as part of my message that, you know, when, when, it, when time goes by, and as I say, like I've evolved as well, you know, as an entrepreneur and I've grown up and changed my way of thinking and my way of doing things drastically, like from, from, you know, from being in a, a as you said, like a lot of the times we joke about digital nomads being just broke uh, backpackers with laptops, <laughs> right? Because 
it's the same one thing you're on a budget you're traveling you're and you again you know you go to that extreme you're always in that extreme and it's so the, it's the it, it's the reflection of what people see as a hostile not hostile environment but living in yeah okay. yeah in a hostel exactly now talking about time and productivity and things like that yeah when you when you bind those two together and say like how can i still enjoy this part of social you know my social life and the cultural aspects and things like that but yet get things done and focus on my business because it's part of that mm -hmm. and it's not it's not all about ah uh, like nine to five right and then because that that's that's the issue here the mindset that they have is not about being a global citizen it's just about running away from the lifestyle the whether it is a shitty or boring or whatever lifestyle that they have so that they can just live the life of their dreams which is something that you know has been pictured by gurus or whoever so that, that mindset is not always open when we're talking about open your heart. And I think it really comes, it comes down to that core. When you have that open mindset, you say, well, yes, I was born in Mexico, but that doesn't mean I have to stay here. Well, yes, you know, I speak Spanish, but that doesn't mean that I cannot learn Japanese. And well, yes, let's say in Russia, they do things this way. But that doesn't mean it's, it's bad or it's better because they do these things the other way in this place. So I, I think when it comes to the phrase or they say about that vision, it's, it's always like thinking about the diversity or unity in diversity. So it's all together. It's not about black or white or not even gray, but it's about black and white. And that's why I, you know, push this thought to people so much and saying, don't think about choosing between money or mobility. And it's not even about one or the other or like it's not either, or it's yin and yang. Exactly. Very exactly. Cool. So it's one and the other. I was at and on capital letters. So I say money and literally write it on capital letters. Mobility. Why? Because you don't freaking have to choose this, you know, between these two things. And again, it goes back to really that whole mindset comes back. And it's so funny because it's part of the story. It's part of my story. But in Mexico, we have this term we call uh, fresa. Fresa is literally means strawberry like strawberry but in in slang terms in mexico fresa would be someone who's like a like a maybe a junior or maybe someone who like likes money and cars and you know who who wants a, a good lifestyle so someone will speak like oh yeah like hey what's up like yeah you want to go to someone who sounds a little bit posh or so mm -hmm. and my dad literally <laughs> you know I, I give a lot to my dad because, because even though it's like, oh, he was so mean or whatever, it's not about that, but it's about how he really shaped me because he was one of my, you know, main core teachers, let, let's call them. And yeah, he used to say, you are a hippie fresa. Because I was like, oh, like, I want to have a good lifestyle, but like, peace and love, I want to travel. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, ha, you know, kind of making fun of me, poking and saying like, ha, ha, you're so incongruent, incoherent, like, you can't have both that was the message that i was receiving like haha yeah right you want to have a car but you want to travel like that doesn't you know it doesn't bind together and so it was a lot of discussed the thing exactly i think a lot of also what you're saying also has to do with what resources our fathers and many fathers or mothers have had before us and they don't they don't recognize the power of what the internet did for us it allowed safety for one and then it allowed the ability to communicate fairly quickly of what's going on. Um, one of the areas yeah. that you talked about and um, you said, I utilize this same strategy or so to learn a language. What is that framework that you're talking about? So that, that is actually the framework that, you know, we, when we mention mindset, skills, and tools, it, that are, are the three, let's say you could call it three pillars, three steps, three, whatever, but these three core principles are the actual thing that I apply for every single thing. So it's, how do I need to think? Cause it's always about that, right? Like when you ask the question, the way that you frame the question will change the answer completely. Absolutely. And so it's not talking about the mindset and the global citizenship in all these core areas. Cause let's say talking, uh, speaking languages or adapting, being local, all these things are like micro, let's call them like micro, splinter you know type of results or yeah mini core 
things that all complement together with the global lifestyle. But being able for you to evolve into whatever it is that you want to accomplish. So it's like being successful in a certain area, right? It all goes back to the mindset, the skill set, and the tool set. So it's, you know, specific questions. What do I have to think? How do I have to think? What's right, the beliefs that I need to have to make this work? So you can reprogram that mindset, right? Well, languages are so hard. As long as you think that, then of course you won't learn language, right? So what's the first thing that you have to do? Oh, you go back to the core, all the way deep inside into you know, the, the root of the problem or the root of the thing that you're having or the, that you're trying to approach and then change it, right? And then from there, it, it goes uh, up to the skill set to say, well, all right, so maybe I believe it's possible and, you know, I, but I don't know how to do it, right? Or what do I need to do? So it's mindset, how to think, the skill set, how to do or what to do, and the tool set, what do I need, right? So it's about the things that you need to have, right? So think, do, have yeah. in those three, right? Think, and it's that is, process. This is so relevant also to like what moved is about, what my, what all of that is. And a lot of what that is, and I'll maybe add one more to it because what a great way that you laid it out is fantastic. And I'm going I'm to add just one more. And it's very interesting that you bring this up because it's, it's almost like looking in the mirror. But when I came back, that was exactly what it was. I, after I started travel, I started going, what other skill sets can I learn? And so then I would go try to learn Thai. And then when I came back, it's like I started playing guitar and I never played before. I decided to meditate and I did it for over an hour and a half for three months and getting taught there. And there's one thing that I found that you really have to, to do. And especially as you start to get older, you have to find what's the repeatable fundamentals of that skill. And you have to have repetition to break the pattern you had before. And so if you're, if, any time that like, for example, I wanted to learn how to play guitar. I knew that I was already a little bit older. And so those muscles weren't going to just walk normally in the way that I would <laughs> learn dexterity. And so what I did is I chose to play. Now this is extreme, but my desire to learn was high. I decided to play for three hours a day for an entire year. And I didn't miss a day. I woke up in the morning and I played and I played and I played and I played. And after a year, I still am no, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> But after a year, I could play blues, I could play songs, and I wanted to take that thing every single country that I went in. And so I think that what you just laid out is exactly what it is. It has the ability to say, I could actually do it. And then what's the skill set I need? And then what are the tools? I, I, I think that you just nailed it. I think that um, you have another thing that you say in here. You, have a, you did a really good job. I, I really uh, want to tell you, you did a good job. And and in this ebook, um, you guys should go download it. It's fascinating. It tells your story. It's great. And it's humble, um, but it's very direct. But you say in here, you said, um, you see people that travel for two reasons. One's for status and one's for growth. Maybe you can share a little bit more about that. I think uh, you see when we're talking about status is pretty much the average. And I, I, I got to find this out or kind of, got clarity in this aspect because of how my parents used to think about the traveling as well. Cause I was always moving around and I had constant conflict on my mom, especially she, you know, she used to say like, you are no King, you are no rich man to, to be, you know, traveling around the world without working. Cause that was the perception that she had. Right. Man, so for man. her, <laughs> yeah. And for her, it was like her reality. Right. It's, it's just, it's so fascinating how people sometimes even unconsciously or subconsciously, they push those beliefs that they have, that mindset around or to other people, right? Especially kids or whatever, because that you're, you're yeah, <laughs> you're nurturing them, right? As you go through education. But the key here is she used to say, you have to work and you have to, you know, do this, but you cannot just chill around the world. You cannot just travel with, you know, with no motive or, or not, no, no purpose. And while that was her perception, I used to fight so bad to try to change her way of thinking. Cause I was like, like you believe 
that I'm trying, I, I had a, a very, a very um, particular fight with her, let's say. I once wrote an email with like 5,000 words and uh, it was, <laughs> I don't even want to remember what I wrote because I, I know it made her cry, but I was, I was in Kazakhstan. I lost uh, my, yeah, was it? No, I was in Georgia. I was in Republic of Georgia. I lost my passport. And, um, you know, my, that's the, the moment that my parents were like, you see, I told you, <laughs> like, you're, you, you know, you don't grow up. And it was just so clear to me that they had this perspective of traveling as something is like leisure or something that's cool or something that's just fun and entertaining. And it's to run away from that reality or run away from that thing that they have. So it's literally a holiday or a vacation. Whereas people like you and me, we don't necessarily have to run away to travel or to go to, to, to a different place. So if you go to a five-star hotel or whatever it is, it's okay. You can visit, you know, you, you're a tourist, you, you go there, you take pictures, you enjoy five, one week, two, two weeks in, in a country. But there is no specific objective or intention for that person to really connect with the country or connect with the, you know, the people, the language, the, whatever it is to even understand it to even the surface level and say like, how does things, how, how do things work here anyway? Right. Cause, cause it, that's the last thing that you were thinking about. If you want to rest and travel and, and have a holiday away from your business and from all these things that are just chaos and turning out fires, then of course you're not thinking about, you know, that perspective of like, Oh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be amazing for me to spend a day in the temple. And <laughs> I don't know, it's just a very different way of thinking. And so that's how I divided it to, to kind of make it clear when, when it comes to a large percentage of digital nomads, they don't travel for growth. It's not because they want to grow personally because they're thinking about that, that development or complementing these things into the life and thinking, well, the, you know, this will make me a better person. How can I uh, apply these things into my life they're, they're literally just there for the sake of being there because it's cool and because they again they want to run away from something that they just mm. didn't like or didn't want and i don't i don't think that running away is the answer uh, you know a lot of times i mean i have things that i also avoid of course but traveling to run away is literally traveling for status when you travel for growth you have a whole different vision and that's why i say the traveling is not the goal that was my realization. Mm. I had this epiphany eight years after traveling. I said, like, if I die today, I had, I have amazing pictures. You can have them, Jason. Like, I can send over my hard disk. Very pretty pictures of Japan. Very pretty pictures. But what does that do in a deeper level, in a significance level? What does that do? Nothing. In my heart, I cherish it. And, I, oh, it's so amazing. And I have these memories for me. But if I die, like, there's no impact beyond what I did. Mm. And there's no help in, in changing other people's lives with what I experienced. So the whole point is, even if you go to a place and you do it for growth, the main thing would be not to keep it for yourself and to actually share it with people because that's what gives it the deeper purpose. And that's what I believe for me was the, the, the life-changing thing that it made me evolve from you know, being selfish by mistake to actually sharing and thinking, well, yeah, I can share because there's very, very different ways of sharing that part of the growth of the travel with people. You can share guides, right? Like where to go, where to spend time, where to blah, blah, blah. Mm. But for me, it was always about, I see all these people spending seven, 10, God, I used to see expats or even travelers, but spending so much time in a country and not even learning mm. 10 words of the language. Mm -hmm. And you know, it got to the point that I was, I was getting upset and I, it was almost personal. I said like, dude, can't it be possible that you've been here for seven years and you can't even say thank you. Like it pissed me off for, yeah. for, literally. I, you know, it's funny you say that because when I, there are certain countries I lived in and I'd stayed for so long. And when I would see other foreigners come in and they treat them like shit, I, I became, I just instinctly like, Hey, you can't do that. Yeah. What do you, in certain countries, cause you're going to get killed. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now. You're <laughs> Like, and they're going to, they're going to literally yeah. hang you on a tree and they're going to look in, inside the tabloids. It's going to say, um, uh, killed himself, but, and he has a bunch of knife wounds, you know, and it's like, this is like, <laughs> what is there? But that, that isn't every single country. 
I mean, this is in every single country. I think um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you. I like to kind of pull something that's out in the news and then kind of get a little bit of your opinion on it. So it brings a little bit of something out of the blue, right? So this is just, yeah. um, this was the news and world news, uh, business, uh, business travel news.com this came from, and it was a survey. Most buyers project 2021 domestic travel return. About three quarters of corporate travel buyers and procurement professionals surveyed this month by the Global Business Travel Association project. Their organizations will assume non-essential domestic business travel sometime this year if they haven't already. There's your spot. About 60% of approximately 302 respondents to the GBTA survey, which was conducted online March 8th through the 13th, indicated they believe their organizations will return restart such travel in the second half of 2021, with about 24% projecting no restart until 2022. About 7% indicated such travel already has restarted with the remainder suggesting it would start by the end of June. What are your thoughts on guys like yourself traveling and actually doing those things with our numbers like this? It's pretty funny that you, that you mentioned that because there, there's been a lot of changes in the travel industry, right? And the way that we do things, particularly nowadays and even countries like Bali and countries like uh, Thailand, well, Bali is not a country, but <laughs> I mean, places like, yeah, I guess, yeah, so. countries like, <laughs> it's like countries like Africa, right? <laughs> but uh, in, I, it's, I, I particularly think it's a benefit because the way that things are turning right now, what's happening in, let's call it predictions, right? But what's going to happen and how the, 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 times right now are really shifting the, the industry and the way that we see the world, the way that we see travel, I think it's pretty, it's pretty unique. And when, when it comes to that, one of the aspects is the travel restrictions and all this new, right? There's so much uncertainty or things changing every single day, whether it is new regulations or new blah, blah, or, oh, now you can't come again, or now you actually can, but you have to stay for at least, right, a certain period. And so I think what, it, what, it's doing this, this two parts of this that are happening. One is what's happening with the, with the people who want to travel, right? Like with us, we're, we're like desperate. We're almost turning tables and we want to be able to move. And we are restricted into a certain, um, up to a certain way. And the second part would be the, the actual industry and how I think it can turn for us and how we can actually leverage that. And the, the, the first part that we're talking about you know, what it really is creating for us as, as travelers. I think uh, there's a growing <laughs> urge for us to, to travel and to move and right for, for, to actually see and experience real things. Because nowadays everything is virtual and we, we don't, we're not able to touch directly. We almost see it as, as not, not fake, but we have a very clear distinction of like, oh, I want to have real experience with real people, right? Or like mm -hmm. physically. And so I think that so far the, the 2020 and 2021 will be times where the travelers will have that growing urge and wanting to go to places, wanting to see new things, wanting to do different things. But here's the key, uh, you know, the, the part that I believe is very important and very crucial is if as a traveler right now at this very moment, you leverage that time and you focus on getting the money out of the way because that's one of the things that they will say oh i don't need money or yeah i don't i don't care about money well i know that money is not your focus but you should get money out of the way so that then you can focus on what's important for you right so if if traveling if the meeting people or being in a different country if that is what means that significance or that purpose for you then that's cool but right now particularly is when you can actually that you don't you know have that capacity to move that much then isn't it smart for you to really focus on building a business this very moment today so that tomorrow at the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022 or whatever the time it is because no one knows that you're ready with stable profitable something you know an actual income let's say 10k so to start that 
with those 10K, you can move and you, you don't have to be constantly worried about, you know, on, on the middle line or borderline of, I feel, because that's what I did. I, I feel so alive, but I'm yet barely surviving, mm-hmm. you know, as a backpacker or as a whatever. I want to keep traveling, but I don't focus on the money. I don't get that part of the way. And I think particularly, as I say, the urge will be something positive for people that will want to move in the future. So that's the, the, the tourist industry or the things like that will, they will definitely have a, an uprising. I believe they will have an, you know, an uprising so that uh, period. This time, in these numbers that we're looking at, take that time to strengthen yourself and then know that you're going to be going and traveling. Take this time to kind of put yourself in a position where you're financially good, focus on that, and then you can go and you can travel. So let's say that um, you were you decided you were going to travel now and you're about to take off to someone for somewhere for six months. What do you suggest somebody, what are some of the tasks that they should do before they leave? So it really depends on the objective. If, if they're going for travel, let's say for a long-term travel, or if they're actually going there to let's say stay and leave in that country, it, it would be a bit different, but the, the, the main goal here would be for them to have first, of course, a, a stable income, right? Something which is a bill, I say a built proven process for their business, which can actually constantly bring them that revenue profit, of course. Mm-hmm. And the, the main thing where, where I would tell people to focus on would be, of course, from 5k up to 10k which is the average of someone doing it realistically so once you reach that stage then you know it's maybe you can start moving but if they drop the ball or they start focusing on other things getting distracted then that you know might definitely go go down so some of the and I, I actually prepared I haven't had that workshop since you know since the whole thing started but I prepared a couple of things when I want to do a workshop and say you know, what do you need for you to be able to, to live properly for you, for you to be able to thrive in that country and to focus on the business without, you know, without losing that momentum. And one of the things is, was, of course, the preparation part, you know, there's like the pre, the ongoing and maybe the after once you're there, right? So when, when you're talking about once you're there, of course, there's all this transition. I'm, I'm also talking, uh, I'm talking about also like the prep that you do, like the, the infrastructure yeah. that you prepare, you know, like, who who's going to get any checks that come in who's gonna you know who, who's going to get the mail so that you don't look bad they're like excuse me your mail is box has been stuck. yeah i've had that and they're like hey you better get your mail it's been four months i'm like mom you need to go i need you to go get my mail. So <laughs> well that's you, you don't check your mail in four months that's a whole new level man <laughs> it's, yeah i mean but you just you know when you get off you start trying you forget those little things so maybe some of those things that you would want to prepare. I mean, one of the areas that I found was having somebody actually be able to be a, be a, not a paralegal, um, be a um, legal term, um, a signer of my documents. I'll remember the name of it. Um, yeah. Having yeah. somebody uh, be a uh, power of attorney to handle maybe documents that are there. Did you find that that would be a valuable thing as well for you? Yeah. Yeah. In terms of business, I, I've, I've done that as well, actually. So it's, um, as I said, it's like, it's, well, yeah, I, I actually, it, it is the other way around because I, I had, or I found those people in those countries where I established, let's say, in Republic of Georgia or wherever it is, go to that place. I develop that relationship. I find someone who I can trust, you know, that network. I see what's happening in the business. I see which are the advantages and opportunities for me. If, if any say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is something um, that adapts to what I want to do. And maybe this is a way to do it. Then I start moving things around that country. And then I, I put someone from that country to, to sign or to do things for me. Okay. And I say it's, it's the other way around because I think you were referring, of course, to like home, right? It's like, yeah, at home, yeah, there's one thing. And, not, and, and when you travel, there's certain things that need to be taken care of. And, you know, one of the things that I did is I went into my Google Drive or whatever. I took a picture of my driver's license and all those things. <laughs> and then I would just share that with somebody that could have it. And they'd be like, hey, I need your ID. Or I need... And then at least they have the ability to kind of act a little bit on your, on your behalf. What about banking? How, what, have, what have you found with banking? If you're, if you're popping from here to here, 
Um, what has been your banking situation? What, what, what do you suggest in banking in that scenario? I actively have five or six different accounts in different countries. So it does, it's not really restricted to, to one place. But again, I, I always try to find, you know, if there's anything in terms of legal things that I have to move, then of course, try to find someone who can do those things for me, right? And um, well, at home, it is always easy to go back to mama dada or something, right? Like, hi, can you, because I, I keep, I do keep uh, uh, a lot of the things, legal things and, and other stuff at my parents' home, in, in my parents' place in here in Mexico. But if it's regarding all the countries, then it, it also depends where I am and the minimum time that I stay, but I would open an account if it's possible as a foreigner mm -hmm. and trying to keep maybe that currency there and also optimize it in the way that whether you get paid in euros or you get paid in dollars or you get paid. So try kind of trying to optimize it that way. And so I have this thing where when, whenever I charge euros for, let's say for people in Spain, because I, I used to sell to, to people in Spain, then I had that one specific account where I would you know send the euros to. So it would be a merchant account from the same company, but in a different country. Yeah. So moving or, or optimizing that in a way would be easier for you to move the money and for you to move the, let's say the assets around. And yeah, it, it like I have say peso or I have dollar euro or maybe other kind of currencies, which you want to uh, use eventually. If you go to a new country, then it depends whether you want to be holding, you know, you don't want to be holding cash. And, and every time you have to take the money out in the ATM and then it's like recurring commissions and all these things. Right. So if it is about becoming that local and really establishing into that place, then the best way, and I found it, whether it is for me to really learn the language and then just ask directly with the people in their language and say like, Hey, so what's the best account or finding someone who has that connection. So of course the local who, has been there 20, 30 years and say, hey, so this is what I want to do. What would you do, right? And that's, that's you know, talking about one specific process, that's what I did um, with, 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 the, with the company. So instead of spending, it was like the average was like, let's say $1,500 for incorporating the company and, you know, doing all the sign and the signature process, whatever it is. Plus opening the bank account, you know, all these legal procedures when it comes to incorporating a business. So maybe for, to, I guess that, uh, yeah, that opens up a good door. So let's say that you, you, you go into Europe and, or are you going to go get the British pound or so? What is, <laughs> what are the, what are the common, I know each country has different things, but what are some common things of opening an account in a different country? A lot of them especially nowadays because of, you know, U.S. restrictions, they, they, a lot of them, they, they require things related to the IRS. Like they track you so bad, you know? So if you're a U.S. citizen, <laughs> it's pretty hard to keep money in other places without, you know, letting people know or letting the government know. But um, talking about the, the, all the, the core things, of course, the passport, right? The, <laughs> that would be. Yeah, no, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. So passport, um, yeah. And then maybe sometimes term you need to show that you're going to yeah. be here for a while or do you have to be there? Yeah. Yeah. So while? whether it is, whether it is a, a permit or, you know, if you're a tourist as a, like 30 days, then you're probably not going to be able to open a bank account. The, 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 you know, they'll ask what, like, why on earth would you want to open a bank account here? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to find that long-term excuse or that way for you to connect legally to the country. Cause that's, that's the thing. Even if they say, you know, you and I, we go to Thailand and we spend a great time and we connect emotionally, but we don't connect legally. We like, we are always going to be citizens of our country and we never have anything to do with Thailand, but for them to give you certain perks would be for you to be able to use their system. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe the things that us is not so good at, you go out there and use Indonesians, right or the things that Mexico is not so good at. If I, if I had a business registered in here operating, then I had to pay 34% tax. But since I have it registered in another place then, right? So it, it really comes back to that. And the bank account is almost always tied to the business or to that legal excuse. Mm -hmm. So there's two versions that you always have. You have the, the real version, 
it's like so what are you doing well i'm spending 35 days in thailand and then i'm actually going here and but because it's my like brother's wedding then i'm going back to mexico and then i actually da 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 and then after that and authorities would be like huh like no like yeah you know explain it to me in a simple way and be like yes you know the answer is when you have to sign a paper it's like yes or no you're like oh it's complicated right you just have to choose one yes or no and so that's that's the version you have to have for authorities to give you those advantages as a tourist that becomes local would be what is your excuse legally what is your version for you to say oh well i am living here or i am starting a business here or you know something that relates to that in 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 a way that you can prove it with paper so that's that's almost the easiest way for you to do it and this this of course all the countries that don't have that many restrictions but i do remember a couple of times that um I had a couple of friends in in Belgium and Netherlands and I you know I just texted them and said hey like do you think you can help me out you know if I want to open an an account in Belgium or or Netherlands and they're like yeah but you know it's pretty complicated uh, and I just asked them can you please go so they they went for me they actually asked see how much money they could move and you know if I could make a couple of transfers and and of course not a big transfer first just to kind of prove that the money is getting there that it's safe and then I would do a bigger transaction <laughs> but yeah there was like you know there was a whole thing when it comes to western european countries you know like larger mm-hmm. of course the more complicated they become right and so all these things that r- right now that we're talking about uh moving the money right the incorporating the the business or running the business even let's say you have a business in the us but you want to be able to have an event in bali how does that even work? That that is all about the tool set or the aspect of the resources when it comes yeah. to the thingy thingy, right? Yeah, the, the, the tactics of being that traveler or global citizen with the business. Because it's very different when people say, Oh, I'm gonna globalize my business. I'm gonna, right? I'm gonna expand my business internationally. And then it's just like your website turned into Spanish and trying to sell to other people when you don't even understand the language, mm-hmm. you don't even understand the market. And let alone, of course, you've never even been there and you don't know how things work there. So, and I've made my mistakes as well, man. Like I opened a business, an online business, trying to operate an online business for for maybe with a structure that wasn't so simple to process payments online. So I had, I almost shoot myself in the head because, you know, because I didn't do my due diligence the right way. And that's the things that you learn along as you explore or as you go to different places and say, well, this sounds interesting. Maybe it works for what I want to do. So I'll do it, right? And again, it all comes down to, to the three things. It's the mindset, the skill set, and the tool set. What do you have to think? How do you have to think? What do you have to do, right? And even if you can't do it, then who knows how to do it, right? Because it's maybe for me, it would take a year and a half or two years for me to speak just about the right, uh, amazing Georgian for them to think that I'm Georgian, <laughs> Right. And then go to, 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 to the local, whatever it is, and try to figure it out by myself. Mm-hmm. And it's not even about the language. Sometimes it's just about the experience that they've had. So I, I call someone and say, have you opened an account, uh, uh, business before here? Yes. Okay. So what do I have to do? Oh, A, B, C, D, F, G. Like, oh, okay, great. So how long does it take me? About oh, two hours. Really? Yeah. I, was, I thought it took like two weeks. He said, yeah, because that's the way the foreigners do it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, huh, yeah. you know, so I just found the back door and that's the whole point. When you find those back doors and you can, you, you know, you can get there easily and take advantage of whatever it is in any country that you're. So what country um, would you suggest? I have a few on my list that, um, you know, someone says, look, I, I, I've taken care of all of my, I'm structured. I've, I've taken pictures of my driver's license, passport, you know, my thing, I can handle that part. I got some money. Where would you say would be the first place they should go to get that experience of being being in another country and then maybe stay, even if it's a few, let's say three months, you know, not everybody goes and does yeah. it, you know, but I think a 90 day is, is, is good. 90 days is, that'll, that'll, that'll seep some stuff into your blood when you leave, you know, it's not the whole thing, but you'll, you'll get something yeah. like that. Where would you suggest that they would go um, first? That that'll leave half a stamp about or one one quarter of a stamp, <laughs> but uh, well, let let me ask you a question. 
are you into let's say are you into mountains or are you into noisy cities well i think i have my answer so basically um <laughs> I suggest going to countries where people tell stories. And the only two countries that I found that were the best were Ireland and Thailand. And the reason that I say that is because when I say they tell stories, I mean that when you go there, they'll actually sit with you and, and express uh, an, an interest and they'll, and they'll laugh with you and they'll, they'll have a drink with you or whatever it is. They'll have food with you. You know, they'll, they'll communicate with you, right? There's, there's this, warmness that I think if you ever go travel for the very first time is very, the more you can eliminate those, like, you know, like I went deep into the heart of the Philippines and I, there's areas I went and I'm like, I don't know how I came out. I don't, <laughs> I don't suggest that. I suggest, yeah. and there's beautiful areas in the Philippines. I was just saying the areas that I went at that time. But I think that what it is I found with Thailand, which would they call the how the, the um, land of smiles, I found that there, the warmness was, was very important for me to feel comfortable to kind of sit down and kind of, you know, there's a whole culture that goes underneath the water, but at least from the start, it's like, wow, this is, this is good. And then Ireland, I wouldn't say that people probably stay in Ireland, you know, six months. I think a lot of people do a, a jump in, go into O'Connell street in Dublin and, you know, um, they do a lot of that fun stuff, but I do think that that's a part of it. I think finding a place where people will be, you know, will have a sense of, uh, let's say, welcoming, I guess. And, and I found in certain countries that the barrier of that kindness was different. And it doesn't mean that the, the cultures are better or anything. Like that. It's just that the way they converse in the very beginning is so much different. You know, like uh, Japan was a lot like the Philippines. Once, once you break, there's like a, I don't call it like a buffer. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's like, who are you? I want to know who you are. And then once you get past that buffer, all everything's off and you're sitting, having a great time with them, but there's a buffer <laughs> in Ireland and in Thailand. I didn't find that there was a buffer. It was like, you show up, you smile. We're with you. <laughs> you <know>? Hello, mister. <laughs> Good so enough. Where, where, yeah. what, what country did you, when you look back and you're just like, if I were to run a business and be able to kind of have some fundamental structure because you don't want to just be all over the place I, that i've been i've been there and you're just like <laughs> you're like a you're like yeah. a 12 year old kid right and you're like <laughs> i'm going to disneyland yeah. and you just you're all <laughs> over the place but where would you suggest someone to go and everybody will have their different things but what, what did you yeah, find yeah. fundamentally was a great country yeah. to go to for your first time Yeah, I I was thinking about it as you as you as you speak as well because I guess there's a lot of people who will also find the coldness or you know that that barrier interesting <laughs> in their experience for them to earn that right in, and it also differs in how people see foreigners because in Japan they do see you as a foreigner as a gaijin like an external you know someone but but not in a judgmental way. At, at, at least not as much as China, right? And and one thing before I tell you the country bit, there's there's places where you can even learn the language, understand how they think, do it just as they do it, like literally, you know, become one of them mm -hmm. in all senses except your little face, and you are still not able to. It, it is still very hard. Let's say I'm not. I'm not going to say you're not able to, because to a certain extent, there's not there's not a clear line where we say, "Am I or am I not really right welcome or integrated into the culture?" And for me, that that happened in China. That I I spoke fluent Mandarin. I understood fully. I had a Mandarin like a Mandarin, a Chinese girlfriend. You know, I I had all, all my lifestyle was, was it, it all was rounded with with the same lifestyle that they had. But my thoughts were a bit different. So that alone just made me, you know, very, very hard for me to really bind and, and come together with them. And let's say even because respecting and accepting is very different. I would respect their thinking, but I would not fully accept it. I say, I don't, I don't believe that, you know, things should be done like that. Or I, I don't believe that I should do this, this thing, they, they do it. And so it, it, it always differs with these things. But one of the safe countries 
one of the good places to go, I believe. It, it is probably Indonesia or probably somewhere like Thailand because of that welcoming or because it's so, and I, I guess to a certain extent, it's also a bad thing because maybe the locals, they just start to get so you know, annoyed with so many foreigners like Barcelona. A uh, great city, but ah, uh, just uh, they they call it the city full of play, of people with that with that that are not from the city. Mm. Right? So it's Indonesia. I I I love Indonesia, but I don't. I've been to Bali, but I don't. I really didn't stick to that place for long. So I try to go to the less crowded, less visited places where a foreigner would still be like an alien, right? Mm -hmm. And they, oh God, they would treat you so nicely. And it would be so easy, even if you don't speak the language or even if you don't understand. Of course, as long as you're respectful, they, they're so warm and welcoming in the sense that, you know, you'll, you'll feel at home. And as long as you don't get distracted as well, <laughs> right? I, but, I remember I was in India <laughs> and um, I was in a town called Pune and I was living there and we were um, doing a programming company at the time. And we were programmed a bunch of stuff. And I was in kind of the scenario you, that you're talking about. And I remember living in a hotel where um, I was the only guy that was like me. I mean, there's just nobody <laughs> around, right? And I was there for a good amount of time. And, and about two months into this thing, I didn't see anybody that resembled me. And, and kind of in the starting of this conversation, I was kind of telling you like, the value of being able to have someone kind of go, that's taboo, isn't it? it, it, <laughs> it it's, it's so valuable. And I remember being in a, in a um, I was in a, uh, I was in a department store and I remember it was two stories and I remember being up at the top and I hadn't seen like any, I was like, I had nobody to relate with. And culturally India is a much different country. I mean, it's like, I can't, it, it's, it's so different. I, I love the, the country, but it's so different. You know, it's just the energy, everything is different. And so I was yearning for certain energy and I didn't know it. And the, <laughs> I had no one to relate to. I look over and there's a gentleman, he's looking at some shoes and I heard him talk. And, and he was a, he was a black guy from the UK. And I just walked up to him and I'm like, <laughs> you're the closest thing to me that I've seen all this whole way. And like, we kind of bonded, you know, and we had a great conversation, yeah. but it was like, he was so much different than me, yet he was the only thing that I could relate to. And it was just a cool bonding moment. We became friends and like, it was just really cool. I think that um, one question I was gonna have for you is, how has your friendships changed? Did you find yourself finding more people that are more like you, or did you find your friendships actually kind of trying to do some of the things that you do? From, from the part of friends wanting to do what I do is you, you always get the average, oh, you're living an amazing life, right? Or you always get the average, like, I wish I was living your lifestyle. And every time I, I, I got this type of people saying it, I first, I would just say like, oh, that was literally my response. I was like, well, you can leave it too, right? I, I, don't, I didn't want to make them think that, that they couldn't, but I was like, yeah, you can, you, can, you can do it too. You just need X, Y, Z. And then they were like, oh, no, 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 never mind. I don't want it that much, right? So I always learned to have that or, or to distinguish clearly between someone who is just saying they wish something but I, and actually wanting something, right? And I think from that side, not a lot of people have followed through in terms of really replicating, not even really because I don't want them to have my life. I want them to have, have their own life, but to really, you know, follow those steps in, in, let's say, apply the same blueprint, but have a different result, right? For them, that for themselves. Very, that was very insightful. I like that. <laughs> same framework, but a different result. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, cause we're all different. Right. And so, and, and that's why like, oh, what's, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite country? What's your favorite? Or, you know, what, what would you recommend? And it, it normally it is hard to, to answer those questions because it all depends on the people or the person or the, the vision, the, whatever they have, their attitude, their beliefs. So I will, I would love to be in a place that, oh, great. Then that's a country for what you want or for what you're looking, right? And on the other side or the other side of the spectrum, talking about, um, you know, bonding maybe even with people or or the impact it has had with my relationships is back at home 
I normally used to frequent with with pe even people from high schools I left when I was at high school like that was my last period of time where I really had friends right so those those friends are still kind of my friends but I don't really hang out with them that much you know it's it's more of a hey I'm back let's catch up for a beer see you in two years <laughs> once we're done with the beer and on the other side is I I do have a tendency to stick to the locals but it's always warm to a certain extent, you know, depending on how polarizing the country is, it is always incredible how warming it could be to just find someone, as you say, like even completely different, but just totally different. Yeah. And still it's feel the same. The same. Yeah. <laughs> you could be, ah, I've had this experience a couple of times, but imagine like in the middle of a freaking nowhere and then someone laughs I, 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 at something that happened nobody saw it except you and that person and then you're like ha got it right ha ha, ha. You, you like you suddenly create this bond and i used to that's say, particularly i used to say whiskey and a fart will make you make anybody become friends <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta try that one <laughs> i would do this I, I would do the first one more often <laughs> and, and i also i don't we i used huh? to always say that like you know, I loved, I used to tell my friends that after I'd be back for, I was like, you know why we've stayed such good friends? I was like, cause we only hung out long enough for me not to mess it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. So tie tie is kind of into business. I think that there's a transition here. And I think that I kind of want to give you a second to encourage people that there's a lot of things that are changing a lot. And that means I think traveling and opening your mind. And I think that a lot of what and I'm talking about America right now. I think we're dealing with some very hard things in our country. And from my personal experience, um, the, the, the division that we have in our country, I would encourage people to go to another country, spend a short amount of time, and you'll come back and you'll realize that those things were not what you had problems with. They, they were much different. And I encourage people that if you feel that there's, and I'm only gonna say it's like race issue, go hang out with them for a little while and, and realize that we have value of our cultures as much as we don't. I mean, the Hispanic culture, the Mexican culture, I'll tell you as, as a culture of, of uh, a, a white male in the United States, I think it is amazing to watch and see in parks and you watch the Mexican culture and Hispanic, they, they come together and they have they, they all come to the park for a birthday and there's like 50 people there and we, we don't, and there is, I'm not saying it, but, but the majority of the, our culture, we don't do that. And I think that just that one piece, we'd be like, man, maybe, maybe we can, can we have some of that? You know, can I have some of that food? Yeah. And I yeah. think if we do that, you'll realize there's such awesome value in, in each one of our cultures and immediately you know, I was, what was it? My, my roommate in Thailand, my, he lived with me for a long time. He always like, you're my brother. He was a, a, a black German. And, and I remember just going like, I, I didn't, I didn't know that that even existed. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, it's my own ignorance. And there's no reason that that makes any sense to me. Just my instinct <laughs> was I didn't get it. Right. And it was such culturally, I learned so much from him that I just encourage people like you'd be surprised on what's underneath all this shit that we're all like trying to just find out what they're really coming from. So kind of to kind of maybe you can help maybe close us out a little bit that if someone's thinking about traveling and they want to do business, what, what would you tell them? A lot of people think that traveling is about spotting the differences between us rather than finding the similarities between us. But when you have that in mind and you go to a different country, to a completely different country, and you realize to a, that, that to a deep, you know, to the core level, you're, you're just as human as they are. They just have certain different ways of doing things or different ways of saying things. But when you really have the capacity to, to experience it, from from that you know from such a deep level and when we're talking about language i always say language is not about communication and and we we mentioned that before you know i keep learning languages to try to express myself and yet i can't find the words and it's because language is about connection 
and it, it enhances that connection, but that connection can happen with zero words. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see someone in the eyes and you know what they're thinking and you can feel their pain or you can feel their happiness. You can feel what they have inside their head and their heart and not a word is necessary. And I think, as you say, particularly in these days, the issue, I would say part of it was, we try so hard to fit in. And yet when, when we fit in, we just desperately try to stand out. Mm. And it's this common fight in our mind and our heart and saying, I want to be different, but I don't want to be left behind and I want to belong. And that's beyond everything that we can understand because the belonging aspect is what defines a lot of your identity. I belong to this country. I belong to this way of thinking. I belong to this social group, right? When, and, and that's what, that's what connected you, what bonded you with that guy. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I belong it's a, it was not even about I belong to the same country. It was that I belong to a different country. And that was the same, yeah. <laughs> right? Because what was the same here, it seemed different. And then that was the different became the, the, the similar aspect. And so I believe that instead of focusing on those aspects that are different, we should be always focusing on, on what's, you know, the real thing that connects us and what's similar to us. Because if we see it from that perspective, then yeah, to a surface level, the way that the government or the way that whatever it is in the outside, the system can be different. The economy is different, right? The business, the way to do business in the country is different. But all in all, as humans, we are the same people. We have the same fears, the same, you know, we have the same issues. <laughs> Psychologically and mentally and in any way, we all want to be able to have significance. We want to find purpose. We want to evolve. We want to be constantly thriving and, and becoming better. We, we, we're all, you know, walking towards that aspect of life. And I think that's, that's the greatest, the greatest gift that we can have as humans. Understanding that we are, we are all, you know, that yeah. unity and diversity. <laughs> I, I think that you wrap that up amazingly. And I think that what you're doing has a lot of value to people that are in business and, I think that um, what you're doing is you're opening people's hearts into understanding how they can also do business around the world. It's not just your own currency as well. Um, so how yeah. could um, anybody contact you or maybe we could share something maybe where um, they can get a hold of you. So go ahead and share that, Eduardo. Yeah, um, what, I, what I wanted to do as well is share with you guys the, the ebook, of course, that you mentioned. I believe you have it. You, you're free to, to uh, share it with, with all the audience. And if not, I can even give you guys a link as well so you can download it. And um, it would be amazing for you guys to, to read it and also give me feedback. You know, you can find me, of course, in social media. I guess I'll be somewhere posted <laughs> somewhere below. Uh, anything as a reference, of course. It, it, you know, and, and the whole thing here is if there's any way even if it's conversation wise, right? Or, or when you're talking about anything that you read or anything that you think, I, I'd always be happy to, to, to have people reach out and you know, to, to enrich our thinking and our, our development as humans. And of course, in business, when it comes to business, to try to help people build a hybrid model of business that they can work online and offline. That is always something that I'm looking forward to meeting people with the same mindset and I really, really appreciate you having me here and being able to share this with, with all of you people in your tribe. Well, thank you very much. And Eduardo, I, um, Beltron, did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you. And what I'll do is I'll put the link down below. So everybody that's watching this in the YouTube channel that at the very bottom, I'm gonna go ahead and add the link inside there um, so they can look at your ebook. I do suggest you guys do it. It has a great story. Um, and um, fundamental structures that in there as well. And I just want to say thank you. And here we go. We'll do it again. Boom. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> if you like this episode, make sure you smash the like button and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just like Nike is to athletes, Moved is to entrepreneurs.